Hi everyone, it's Sarah Lieberman here. I'm recording this update because it's day 10 of the war here in Israel and I've received so many messages from so many people from all of you all around the world on social media, um, through the website, just saying that you're worried, that you're praying for us and uh, it's not possible to respond to everybody. So I wanted to record this update to tell you what happened to me and to my family starting on October 7th. Um, before I start, I just wanna say we are okay, I'm okay, um, but there was a lot of different things that were going on um, and I, I just wasn't able to respond. So um, I love you, I am thankful and grateful for your prayers. Um, so Saturday morning, October 7th, I woke up very early in the morning. I normally go for a walk uh, very, very early in the morning and very unusually I decided not to go on the walk. So I was up um, and I was outside sitting in the patio at six o'clock in the morning and I was spending quiet time with the Lord praying. Um, and then at about seven, I turned my phone on and I started to see that there were reports about a massive missile attack in the South. Um, and I began to pray and then very quickly at 7.15, there was a video that was posted of um, big trucks, like flat back trucks um, with Hamas terrorists with machine guns and guns in the streets of a city called Sterot, uh, which is in the south on the border. And, it, and the people who were filming it like from their windows were shocked and I, I, I also, I thought, is this a movie set? Like, what, what am I looking at? You know, it was a highly unusual idea that this was even possible. And you just watch them in the video, like gun people down. And I thought, this is major. If there are terrorists in Starot, you know, this is a big issue, a big deal. And I began to pray. And um, I just had this sense, I had this sense th that this is something very big and very different. And um, I wa walked back in the house, I woke my husband up, I said, there's something major going on in the South. And he was like, he's like, what's going on? I said, well, there were rockets that were fired. And he's like, mm -hmm. because we're used to that, because unfortunately, that's the reality of the people in the South of this country. Um, but I said, there's something different. There's something different. And, and I walked back outside and I continued to pray. And I began to be in communication with my brother via messages. And um, reports came in that there were multiple breaches in the uh, barrier fence between Gaza and Israel. And I started to, I said to my brother, I said, I hope there's not hostages and people that are taken and kidnappings. And sure enough, um, within a short period of time, these reports started coming in and my heart sank because of the whole Gilad Shalit situation and the story and the history, you know, of, of Israel and, and what we've been through in the past years. So, um, by then reports about people being trapped in their safe rooms started to come out. In fact, at some point by about, um, 10 30 or 11 there was a woman uh, who was on her phone from inside a safe room with her children hearing arabic outside and shots and saying that they're going house to house house to house in her village um, and they're shooting people and they're killing people and um, lo and behold the first report came that there were um, people being kidnapped um, at the same time this video came out of um, hundreds of people, young people running in a field um, and being shot at. These were the people who were at this peace party um, on, on, the, on the border. And, um, and just watching that and thinking it's so surreal that it's like not reality. Um, backtrack a second. This September, I had gone through an interesting process um, for a writing assignment that I had. I had delved into 9-11 in a way that I'd never delved into. Um, just because I needed to protect myself emotionally, I had never really, you know, I knew what had happened. I'd watched one or two documentaries, but I hadn't like fully, you know, immersed myself in it. Um, and this September, I spent a 
a significant amount of time. I listen to the calls from the towers. I listen to the calls from the planes. I listen to um, air traffic control and the chaos with the with the uh, uh, U.S. Air Force trying to figure out where they're going to send these jets to save these people. Um, and and I I watched you know what happened to the people in the towers and 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 so that was very like fresh in my mind and then immediately after that the second portion of September again for a writing assignment I delved into the Yom Kippur War now I know a lot about the Yom Kippur War having lived here and you grow up learning about it in school but this year in particular I was investigating Golda Meir um, just a lot of the information that Israel had prior to the war and why they made the decisions that they made and how they made those decisions not to be prepared um, and then what happened throughout. Um, there's a movie out, by the way, Golda. Uh, it's interesting. I've watched it. I don't think that it fully explains or portrays, you know, like the sense of the people inside the country, um, but it's definitely an interesting uh, depiction of, you know, some of what happened. So I had all of this in my mind. And another thing is I always, I was always curious about this. In fact, whenever I would meet like, uh, you know, a, an older person in the country who I knew by age, you know, lived through the Yom Kippur War, I would always ask this question, what was it like? What was it like in that day, like living through that day? And I have to tell you that I no longer have to ask that question. I now know what it's like to live through a day with increasingly sinking feeling in your heart and in your soul about what is going on to people, um, what's happening in your country. By 11 o'clock that day, um, people in our as faith community uh, began receiving call-ups, emergency call-ups um, for the army, which is basically what happened on Yom Kippur where it's very very unusual it's basically almost never really ha happens definitely not on the scale never on the scale that happened they called up 300,000 Israeli soldiers within 48 hours so the first well, after 40 the first 48 hours 300,000 and then in the following days they added another 60 so 360,000 soldiers together with about 150,000 which are in our regular um, active army, that's a number of soldiers that they mobilized because of this attack, because of the situation. Um, so my brother was called up that day. Um, other beautiful people that we love were called up that day. And we just spent the day watching in disbelief, in heartache. Um, and by 5 p.m., some of the stories started to come out about what had happened and what some of these families had gone through and what was going through, uh, what was going on. So Sunday morning, I woke up early and I thought, this is much bigger than anyone realizes. So I decided to go to the store and start to stockpile food um, and supplies, um, phone chargers, lead lights, basically whatever you would need to survive through an extended period of time without uh, electricity and um, food and supplies. Um, unfortunately, I didn't buy everything. For example, I did not buy bottled water. I was running, I was rushing because of my, uh, some things I need to get done. And so I didn't buy bottled water. And to this day, we're 10 days later, uh, you can't buy bottled water. Um, so we continued on Sunday. And just as all these terrible reports came in, um, at the same time, I, I had to, um, begin to care for the people in our community um, because we now had people who were affected. We had um, mothers who were left alone um, with children because their husbands were gone, young children and needed help in preparing the safe room and getting all the equipment and, and supplies that were needed. Um, and then the horror stories became came out, you know, on by Sunday um, and then into Monday about people struggling uh, to hold the door of the safe room closed. And many people who were able to hold that door because it doesn't actually lock. So we have a safe room in our house, um, but it, it doesn't lock. You can close it, but it doesn't, you can't lock yourself in. Um, 
the reason that you can't lock yourself in is that if there's a, a bomb attack, you know, that and, and there's damage to your home, that people can open the door and rescue you. Um, no one ever thought that people would be fighting for their lives trying to hold that, um, that handle closed to protect their children and their family. And the absolute atrocities began, came out starting on Sunday. And it was just heartbreaking. Um, it still is very significantly. Um, I can share with you that I go in, you know, I have some days where I'm, I'm better, um, I'm, I'm stronger. Um, I don't dwell on it too much. And then some days where it's just so heavy to carry it. Um, and I have had to really um, guard myself uh, uh, contain my uh, consumption of information. Um, of course, we're up on the news, but you know, um, not be too immersed because it's too damaging to your soul. Um, so we continued, um, I had to care for and, and emotionally support and care for this, the people in our community that the soldiers, um, people who were alone. And then unfortunately, we got the news that one of the families in our community had five people who were missing um, and they didn't know where they were. And that thought, that feeling about people um, in a family who we deeply care for, that five of its family members are in Gaza is, um, It's so devastating, you know. There's nothing you can say or do except to pray. Um, but you want to support and you want to love these people who you deeply love and you want to comfort them and console them, you know, in this situation. So um, by Tuesday morning, I decided that we, our family, um, I forgot to mention, Sunday morning, my husband left. He had a work conference. So I was alone with our children, preparing the safe room, getting everything ready, um, and then supporting uh, pastorally the people in the community. Um, so by Tuesday morning, I figured out that we need to create a solution for locking our safe room. So I spent a bunch of time um, going around stores. Monday night, I had figured out that this is a serious problem and I spent about four hours trying to find water and a few other supplies um, and some more supplies for uh, the other families in the community for some of the women that can drive and the stores were empty there was literally nothing um, there were certain products that were completely out there was no meat zero you could not buy um, uh, lead lights you couldn't buy uh, radio uh, like just radios to hear the news that are battery powered not powered by electricity um, certain food items completely gone canned goods completely gone um, milk um, all kinds of different products that were just like completely and the entire country was shut down so other than stores and pharmacies like food stores and pharmacies so all your clothes stores and your restaurants and your cafes and like anything that's anything other than that it's like covid plus rockets and death and and the holocaust and 1973 all wrapped into one 48 hour period so um, I kept spending time on Tuesday. I any, Anyway, I ended up finding a piece of wood that I brought home and I asked my 16 year old son and he used a drill and a saw and he made us a solution that we could lock that door. And then I ended up in the most surreal conversation uh, with my 16 year old son about how many knives and we would bring into the safe room, where we would hide them and how we would defend ourselves with knives if somebody tried to come in to our safe room, how we would defend the window, how we would lock the window, how we would defend the door. Um, these are conversations that even myself growing up in this country, um, you know, never thought that I would be having with my children. Um, I want to say that throughout this whole time, we we were okay and we are okay and my children are okay and praise the lord that my children are really um 
kept in the shadow of God's wings, you know? Um, so over the next few days, I just, the, this past week, I've had to really uh, just spend my time focusing on the children. They have a lot of questions, especially my youngest. Um, hours and hours of, of answering questions about the whole situation, about so many different things. You know, he's trying to wrap his head around uh, something that you can't wrap your head around. Um, so it, I've, I've spent a bunch of time investing, you know, into the children um, and then into people in the community. Um, Tuesday night, we held a vigil, a, a prayer um, meeting um, with some worship and uh, just praying for this country and for the people. You can see the shock. You can see the heartbreak. You can really feel the hopelessness um, of the people. And uh, even today, 10 days after, I think once some of the stories started coming out about what really happened um, to the people there, about the women, about the babies, about the fighting, about the party, all of these different things um, created this just sense of being overwhelmed. Um, I remember after the first two days, the, like the first initial 48 hours, that night no one slept. Like no one could sleep. And, um, and I realized what it is is that this huge wave of these emotions and, and uh, negative adrenaline, you know, that rushed over everyone and it, it, it got to the point where your body couldn't like absorb it anymore you know um and so we just had to i i had to step back i had to um take measures to preserve my energy and my spiritual strength and my well-being so that i could function well for the family and for the community um and I can tell you that even with everything that is going on, um, the, I, you know, we had this, the whole first few days, the numbers, right? It just kept updating these unthinkable, unimaginable numbers of how many people entered into Israel, um, how many people were killed, how they were killed, um, the injured, um, the, the hostage, we had, several hostage situations, um, the kidnappings, the soldiers that are there, um, and then knowing that Israel would have to do something very significant to deal with Hamas um, because of this situation and the realization setting in um, that there's gonna be more loss of life and more pain. Um, then the second part of the week was spent really trying to pray into and, you know, look at what's happening in the north. So we live more in the northern side of the country. Um, and uh, so for us, the big concern would be war with Hezbollah um, and the Lebanese and Syrian borders. That, that, you know, that would affect us physically a lot more. I mean, on Wednesday night, we, we had to run to the, to the safe room. Um, we had uh, some rockets that were fired that landed very close to us. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other security concerns and, and, and different things that are going on. But um, re it's, it's, been, it's relatively quiet where we are, and that's what's afforded us the ability to really support the people, support the local people, um, support the families who um, have had people die. Um, I wanted to give an update about the family that had five people missing. They found one of them shot dead outside of the home um, and then four people are missing um, a husband a wife older uh, people um, their daughter and her son so that they're all part of one family that is missing um, so i want to encourage you however that your prayers are so important and that standing with israel is so important in this time i know that there's like all this stuff going on in social media. I am purposefully staying out of that right now until I feel that, you know, if I feel that it should be different, I will. Um, but I um, 
have been reading verse after verse, chapter after chapter about God's promises and just praying God's promises back to him um, over the land. Um, I might post some of the verses that I'm praying in the uh, show notes with this video just so that you can uh, pray with us. Um, and then some incredible videos, testimony. Yesterday I heard a testimony of a Hezbollah uh, militant fighter who, who met Yeshua and who came to faith. And so um, there are still incredible stories and incredible details, you know, that God is involved and he's in control and he's watching over his word to perform it to our people. Um, and so there is together with unimaginable heartbreak and tragedy also stirring up within us faith and um, this confidence in God's good plan for our nation, for my people, for this country. So declaring, you know, the good plan that God has in all of this, which we don't know and we can't see right now. Um, I can also tell you that I, I, I am not in fear or anxiety. Um, I, I haven't had the thought to you know, leave the country or anything like that. Um, we are strong, we are united, um, we are in the spirit of the Lord. Um, we are uh, hurting, but we are keeping ourselves in that place of prayer and worship. Um, I realized even more so, you know how, how passionate I am about worship and about prayer, how important prayer and worship is, even more so in this time, in this time of tragedy and agony and unmeasurable pain, that ability to just quietly spend time worshiping the Lord. Um, that is so precious. That's something that we can do. You know, no matter the situation, no matter the situation, you can worship the Lord. Um, even quietly in your heart, even in a tunnel in Gaza. Um, we have been praying for the salvation of, of the people that are there for hope, for immeasurable hope for them. Um, I want to add another prayer point. I don't know if people are adding this, but for divine strategic plans for the military and the leadership just for creativity from the lord because god is the creator and he knows he knows you know what should happen right now and how and what the best plan is and so just praying for that for the leadership as well and for our country um i hope in some way this has been helpful or encouraging to you um and if you have any questions or thoughts or prayers, you can definitely communicate them in the notes uh, and, uh, you know, leave a comment or send uh, something through the website. Um, on a personal note, I will tell you that I was weeks away from releasing a new project called The Invitation. If you've been following me for a little bit, you would know a little bit about that. We literally just finished, just before the war began, um, an entire album in Farsi, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, together in partnership with incredible Iranian worship leaders and then in Arabic also um, as part of this project that God had asked me to reach out to the Middle East with um, these songs, with these words, with these biblical powerful words. Um, so we're going to have to put that on hold just for a little bit because it's uh, I didn't feel that it was possible. I, I didn't feel that I could inside myself, you know, start uh releasing this right now um and i i don't know it's it's the timing of the lord you know he's in control he knows what he's doing so if this is what he you know it, it, this is his message these are his words that are going to go out to the middle east and i think that it in some ways it could be even more powerful after this uh that from israel we would reach out to our enemies from Israel, we would reach out to the people who are trying to kill us um, and share with them the message of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel. So thank you again. Thank you for praying. Um, and um, I will try to send whatever update I can. If this is helpful for you, if this is helpful uh, to hear from me, then let me know. Um, and uh, that will encourage me to, <laughs> to do that again.
<laughs> all right. Um, may the Lord of all peace and hope fill you with his blessing and his hope uh, in this day. I love you. I miss you. So many dear friends have messaged me. Um, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for reaching out. I see it all and I, I am loved and blessed and encouraged by it.